Doug has a master's degree from Northern Illinois, Northern Illinois University in geophysics and geology, and he's been working in Texas for the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, he's been around the block, and I, uh, you can read his in bio in the uh, bulletin, so I'm not going to do that, read it from you, so I'm just going to turn it over to Doug. So Doug, come on up. Thank you, Steve. Sometimes I feel like I've been around the block more than once. Um, it's uh, been a lot of years and a lot of, a lot of different work and a lot of different projects, but it's been, been a, lot, a lot of good experience for me. Um, so today I want to talk to you about look before you drill. Basically what we're going to cover are the applications of geophysics to groundwater problems. So we're going to look at what is geophysics, kind of give you a definition for what generally what it is in case you don't know what that is. Look at some of the beneficial uses of geophysics. We're going to look at various applications. Uh, talk about the tools and the methodologies that we use uh, in the geophysical world and, and the capabilities and some of the limitations of the methods. And I got a few examples. I want to show you how we applied it and give you some ideas how you might be able to apply it in your project or your site as well. And then look at some final thoughts or final considerations on the methods. So geophysics, what is that? What, what's that mean? Get this to work? Yeah. There we go. I have a definition here. It's rather lengthy. I'm not going to read it right now. So suffice it to say, what we're talking about are remote sensing technologies that we use to image the subsurface. These are technologies we take out into the field, we collect data, we come back, we process that data, we look at it, and we're able to get a better understanding of what's going on in the subsurface to help you make better decisions about your site and about your project. Okay, uh, various classes of geophysics. The first class is the whole Earth geophysics, and that's something that's utilized for earthquake-type geophysics or mapping the thickness of the crust or the core. Those are the things we're not really interested in. Next class is explora exploration geophysics. This is used in uh, um, oil and gas exploration, very common applications. Uh, but they also have, have applications in the, in the water world, some of the more deeper wells that we might be looking at. And then the shallower applications within the upper uh, 300 feet or so. These also have applications to the groundwater industry as well. So what are some of the benefits of using geophysics and utilizing geophysics? Uh, one of the first things to realize is these are tools. And each tool has its own separate benefit. And these are remote sensing tools that we, that we utilize. Um, Geophysics is fairly fast and effective. We can go out and we can collect quite a bit of data, cover quite a bit of area, and get a vast amount of information in a relatively short amount of time. It's non-invasive, so we don't go into a site, we don't cause a lot of problems, we don't tear up the land. You go in, you collect the data, you're gone. You usually no one knows you were there when you, after, after the fact. Uh, it's data that can fill in the gaps. It can fill in that information in between boreholes, in between wells that we don't have if we have to make another decision or obtain additional information on the hydrogeology of the site. It also uh, is something we can access in remote areas. We can get into the tough, tough areas and collect data where it's, sometimes it's hard to get vehicles and, and uh, uh, other equipment that we might use, uh, say, in the drilling or, or drilling world. And then also allows us to get us an overall good visualization of the subsurface. We get a better picture of what we're seeing, and that's important in making decisions. And it, that, these things all kind of culminate, culminate to a better overall, better site characterization. And from that, we can take smarter uh, locations for borings. We can have a better understanding of what our hydrogeology looks like, and we can better place a well, better place a boring to get the information that we ultimately want to get. So one thing to, I wanted to say, too, is that this geophysics is not to, uh, does not, we don't use it instead of uh, drilling. It's something we use to complement drilling and complement borings. So what can you expect to accomplish uh, with this methodology? Excuse me. So we can map things with a significant contrast or physical contrast. So we look at things like uh, the density of a rock. If we have a change in density, we can map that. Change in the velocity, which is related to density uh, of the rock, we can map significant changes in velocity. And different types of rock, different types of soil have, will have different velocities. 
uh, electrical properties, how conductive can electricity go th through the subsurface or how resistive is it to uh, electricity. We can map these things well and different, again, different lithologies will have different uh, contrasting el electrical properties. And then magnetic properties. In, uh, in the igneous volcanic areas, we can map fractures and faults using uh, magnetic applications. So um, we can map very significant, different significant features. Uh, we can look at lithology, we can look at the thickness, the depth uh, of various lithological layers. Uh, aquifer boundaries, where is the aquifer, how thick it is, is it at depth? Uh, we can also map water quality in some cases, in some instances, if we have enough of a contrast in the water quality, we can see that as well. Um, and then geologic structures, which is, which is good to know for siding wells as well. Uh, faults, fracture zones, karst, and the like. And also, we can use these methodologies to uh, map environmental contaminants. Let's, so here's a, I've got a couple of just short examples here. Um, this is a seismic section. We're able to map depth to rock, looking at the uh, shallow alluvium over a bedrock layer. And we have a contrast between these two materials, so we're able to map them. Here's a, an electrical cross-section. Again, these are distance and depth when you see a cross-section here on, on my presentations. And we're able to see different electrical properties, which allows us to look at uh, dipping strata, various later layers. And in this case, we're able to map some karst features that were in the subsurface, getting more information about in detail what's going, as to what's going on there. So not only to the water industry, there are a lot of other industries that we have uh, geo, that geophysical um, methods can be applied to. It includes the environmental industry, uh, remediation, contamination, investigation, oil and gas for exploration. Uh, the power industry for design and construction of facilities, um, the infrastructure industry, roads, bridges, dams, levees. We can use geophysics to assess the integrity of these items. And then mining. It can be used in, in mining applications as well. So quite a few uh, other applications bes besides the water industry that we can use and apply geophysics to. So I said earlier, each one of these methods is a tool. We have several different tools in our toolbox when you're using a tool, it's important to use the right tool for the right job. So it's good to know what that tool is used for and how you apply it. I'm just going to briefly go over these tools. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each one of these in this particular presentation. But one of our key tools is the seismic tool, which, which measures changes of velocity uh, in the subsurface. Again, different materials, different rock, different soils will have varying velocities, and we can map those. Again, electrical resistivity or electrical methods. This will map how resistive current is to the ground. So uh, a, um, a sand or gravel or a limestone might be very resistant, give a high resistivity. A clay would be uh, lowly, low resistant to, to electricity and give a uh, lower resistivity number. So we can map lithologies. Again, then something like electromagnetics also measures electrical properties, but it measures the conductivity, which is the inverse of, of resistivity. And we can get similar uh, information from electromagnetic methods as well. Magnetics measures the magnetic properties of, of the subsurface. Gravity measures the density, changes in density. We can measure uh, structure. We can measure large, larger karst features, uh, various applications for gravity as well. Ground penetrating radar, you probably heard of GPR. This is a very shallow application. And if you have infrastructure at any of your facilities, uh, this is a methodology that can be used to map out the subsurface utilities, piping, that sort of thing that are within the near surface. has a good application for that at times. Uh, downhole geophysics, geophysical logging, probably know quite a bit about that, but that's something we use to uh, in situ map uh, uh, formation parameters at depth in, within the well or, or borehole. And then these applications not only can be applied to land, they can also be applied in lakes and rivers and marine environments as well. There are various applications that way. So with each one of these methodologies, we have quite a bit of equipment that we can use uh, uh, in, in the geophysical world. Typically, though, each one of these will have a series of sensors or antennas. Uh, sometimes there's cables connecting those sensors. Um, and then, then you usually run by a, a computerized box that collects the data, converts it to the, uh, the signal that we can look at and analyze and process. Uh, for smaller jobs, we have smaller equipment. For larger, uh, deeper work, we have to use some of the larger uh, pieces of equipment that you see in the lower lower portion of the slide there. So, when is the best time to use this this methodology? Is it early in the project, or is it late in the project? It depends. Sometimes both. Some sometimes either one. So, early in the project, if you've got a site and you know very little about that site, 
And you'd want to put some borings out there, but you don't even know where to put the borings. So if you go out and do some initial subsurface imaging with geophysics, you can get an overall general picture of what's going on below the subsurface to help you make those decisions as to where you want to put those wells or put those borings. Conversely, if you're late into a project, you've got quite a bit of data, but there's something going on, you know, in, in between your points, and you don't have the information in between your data points, we can then use geophysics to pull out that information to give you a better understanding of what's going on in between these, uh, in between your borings and in between your wells. So just depends on the site and the application. So what can I see? And how, how, how deep can I see? What kind of resolution, resolution can I get? And one of the things I always like to tell people, we're, remember, we're trying to see through dirt. We're trying to see through the earth. So there are some limitations to what we can actually do. Uh, that's always good to know that when going into a project. Also, the solutions can be non-unique. In other words, you can have a, a one set of, a set of data that the interpretation could be two or three different things. So the more you know previously going into your site about the hydrogeology, about the site, the better you'll be able to, to uh, uh, interpret that data and make uh, the inappropriate uh, conclusion. So our maximum depth is based on the type of material, the soil or the rock. It's based on the amount of energy that we can get into the ground. And it's also based on the geometry of our sensors. Typically, the further out your sensors are, the further out your, your sources are and your receivers, the deeper you can go. Um, but that also affects resolution. So these are things to consider when planning a project. Resolution is the ability to how small of something that we can see uh, in the field. So uh, the closer our sensors are, typically, the higher the resolution. The further out the sensors are, uh, the, deep, the deeper we're going to see, but the lesser the resolution. So there is a trade-off. And these are things to know and, and, and apply when you're planning your project. The other thing, it's, it can be pretty complex down there. We have man-made features um, that exist that uh, a single boring may not see or, or may be in the way of the boring. You know, you want to clear it before you go, go through the subsurface. And then the hydrogeology in some areas is fairly complex. Just one single boring, one single well doesn't get you exactly the, all the information you need. So uh, I'm proposing a combination of wells, borings, and geophysics to further uh, minimize the complexity of our understanding of what's going on in the subsurface. So you might say, well, you know, where I live, we just put a well down. We know what, we know our, what our yields are going to be. We get the water we need. So the question is, why bother? Why, why even consider using geophysics? Well, there are certain cases where uh, it is useful and it, and it can be very applicable in the, where, it's, where it's needed. So when your sampling density is inadequate to constrain the problem, you don't just have enough points and you don't understand what's going on, kind of similar to what, what I've been talking about along here in the presentation. Also, when the cost to get enough direct data is prohibitive, you, you just uh, you need, you need that information, but it can be expensive to get in and get it with multiple wells, multiple borings. borings. And also, when site ac access is difficult and you have to get into a site that's, that's difficult, these are... Uh, reasons why we might want to use and utilize geophysics uh, as in, in certain applications. Um, so this particular picture here is kind of an example. You can see it looks, at first glance, it looks kind of similar, but really there's a, there's a zone here. And if we were to put a well, we were, say we were looking for this, tar this is our target zone. It's a deeper sand. We're trying to find that zone. This is kind of on a small scale, but just to give you an idea. If we put our wells here, we could completely miss this, um, miss this location. If we do a geophysical survey, we increase our odds of locating this boundary, and then we can go in and we can site our well where we would want to in this deeper zone and get the information that we were looking for. So here's another example of a, of a sampling density problem. Um, let's assume we've got a 40-acre 40 40 acre site. It's a narrow target that we're looking for, approximately about 50 feet wide. And this could be a fracture zone that's full of water. This could be a sand and gravel zone in an alluvial deposit that might be a, a good resource for a well. So a single boring has about a 4% probability of hitting this target. 13 borings are needed for a 50-50 chance of hitting the target. Over 20 borings are needed for a 90% probability of hitting once. So you're getting the picture. Around 700 borings are needed to map shape the feature within plus or, 50, plus or minus 50 feet. So quite a bit of work, quite a bit of effort to get detail on this site. With just a couple of days of work and two to four geophysical profiles, we can locate this channel. 
So we can get quite a bit of information in, in this case to get, to get the, uh, the location and the uh, constraints of that channel that we are looking for with geophysics. And then we can locate our borings to get the actual physical properties we, may, we might want to get the detail so that we might want to get or a test well that we might want to uh, drill. Here's another example. Um, so as I said earlier, geophysical data complements drilling data, um, but evenly spaced borings can miss a target. So what you're seeing here is a resistivity I find the pointer, resistivity cross-section. This is distance, this is depth, and you can see there's a lot of different changes in the subsurface based on electrical properties. And typically higher resistivities, again, represent sands and, and limestones. Lower resistivities, the cooler colors, represent shales, clays, silts, those types of rocks. So, or it could be a water-filled zone as well, depending on what we're looking for. But if you had evenly spaced borings, as we show here on this diagram, you can see there's some key features that we are missing. There's a change, a lower resistive zone here. There's a larger high resistive zone here. And if these were the targets we were trying to hit, just randomly putting borings in, we would miss them. We came in and did this survey first, then we could select our borings at these various locations and have a much better understanding of what that lithology is and where it is across the site, and therefore make a smarter decision on our boring and our well locations. So another key component to uh, the geophysical surveying is data processing and visualization. Uh, we you rely heavily on GIS data and mapping. Um, most of these methods have their own specific software that's tailored for that method that we utilize. Uh, typically, our, we present the data in 2D profiles and sometimes 3D imagery, which allows us to get, again, a better understanding. And then we identify features or targets or anomalies that are, are in, a, in the data to get, to get a, um, an idea of what we're looking for. So this is a uh, kind of a general example here, um, something that's uh, r uh, relatively new. Um, it's been going on for a while, but relatively new. There's attribute processing of 2D and 3D seismic reflection data. Um, what that is, is we're looking at the various portions of the seismic wave and we're able to determine various things like lithology. We can map thicknesses of sands. We can map por porosity with, with the attribute analysis and even fluid content. And then we can present it in a 3D manner, as you see here, where this image is showing some layers at depth and also showing various thicknesses of zones that, that may be of interest for siding a well whether it's a thick sand, a thin sand, or if there's water present, and even uh, uh, how much water <coughs> based on the, the size of the aquifer. So we have a couple options when doing this. Uh, here in Texas, we're blessed with a lot of seismic reflection data. There is existing data that brokers have. You can go out, you can purchase this data, much fa fairly cheap compared to what you can acquire it for, and you can reprocess this data, reprocess the data. Now, the problem with that is some of the data is focused really deep or it's of older data and the quality isn't that good and the reprocessing processing that data is not going to get you anywhere. But it's worth looking at because if, it'll save you a lot of money and uh, allow you to get a lot of good information. There's even 3D data sets you can get and we can look at 3D uh, seismic data this way. The other option, uh, and it's, it's becoming uh, relatively inexpensive, is to acquire higher, high resolution data, um, new data. And then, uh, Typically, you know, for deeper wells, you're, you're within the upper 2,000 feet. So this can be done relatively easy. Currently, we're uh, doing a very similar approach to a site in West Texas. We're getting ready to start out the field, field portion of that. And once we get that work done, hopefully I'll be able to present some information on that. So here's an example of reprocessing processing seismic data. This is a project uh, that our firm worked on. Uh, the data was collected by another firm, and the data just plain wasn't, wasn't that good. and couldn't get that much information out of it. It was in Lake Okeechobee in Florida, um, seven marine seismic lines. So we were called in to take a look at it and thought we could reprocess it. So we took a shot at reprocessing this uh, reflection data. And you see here the, the top uh, section is an original uh, seismic data, and there's a lot of multiples. It's pretty crowded. You, you, just to the trained eye, you really can't see much going on in, in that section. And again, um, so you orient, this is horizontal and this is depth. And I think this is about 800 feet uh, of data, if I remember right. Here's the reprocessed data. You're starting to see a lot more layers. You're starting to see some structures, a lot more information you can see after we're able to get all the data and reprocess it and pull out some of the features that were inherently in the data. Um, this section shows a 
a little more detail, you can see various formations in the area, the tops of those formations. You can see structures like faulting. You can see uh, dipping beds. So there's quite a few different things that we can pull out of this data. Um, and once we know that, and once we know the formations we're looking at, we can know where we want to put our well uh, if we're looking to site a, a, a water well in something like this. And we can also look at 2D, 3D sections. This is the top of the floor at an aquifer in this section. We're able to pull out from the data, but we can present the data in this type of format as well. It gives you a better visualization of what you're looking at and what you, what you might be able to see. So here's an example. Uh, this is, uh, geophysics was used to site a high-capacity alluvial water well. This is up in uh, northern Illinois. And uh, I like to show this example because it shows two different methods working together to solve a problem. Um, this area had a buried Beckrock Valley. Uh, it's a, a fairly large aquifer in the area. A lot of municipalities use this for their water supply. And this particular community wanted to site another well. So we came in and we put in two resistivity lines and two shorter seismic lines to try to identify with the location of the valley and the thickness of the sands. So here, this top cross-section is one of the resistivity profiles. And you can see the, the, the brighter colors are higher resistive values, which uh, equate to sand and gravel. But one of the problems with this site is the bedrock is, consists of limestone, and our dolomitic limestone, which is pretty much the same kind of resistivity as the sands. So we came in with a seismic to map the depth of the rock. And so we looked for the areas where we had the deepest uh, rock and the thickest resistivity zones, and we we sited a uh, some test wells in this area, and we were able to in the very first test well uh, produce a well that had a yield of a thousand gallons per minute. So we were able to optimize the location of the well to optimize the yield. Um, this is a um, water quality contamination example. This is out in West Texas. Uh, you've got produced water spilled on the surface. You've got an injection well with brine water uh, leaking into the groundwater. So we did a resistivity survey. Again, electrical uh, contrast of brine versus non-brine, very effective. Um, and these lighter blue areas are the areas where the brine was present in the subsurface and in the groundwater. So we're able to identify the extent of contamination, also use this to site monitoring wells and constrain uh, further what the, uh, where the contamination was and how far it might have spread out. And this is an example of an infrastructure project just up the road. This is in Salado Creek in the, in the town of Salado. And they were going to put a uh, wastewater line underneath the creek here in Salado Creek just a few feet under. So there were concerns, some concerns with that. Um, let's see if I can get... So there are some springs in the area. Uh, there's some caves in the area. And the concern was if they were to, to drill into a cave, uh, an airfield cave, that there might be uh, loss of the springs. And also there's a, uh, a, um, a um, Salamander, its habitats in this area, concerned that that salamander might lose, it, lose its, its habitat. So we came in and we, um, we put a, four geophysical lines along the uh, location of the uh, proposed pipeline. And this is some of the equipment. We had to cross the water using the uh, resistivity instrument. And uh, we were able to get cross sections across this creek and look in the subsurface to see if there were any uh, karst or cave features. So here's one section that's located in the middle. Um, again, if we're looking for a cave, we're going to have a very high, it's air. We're going to have a very high resistive anomaly, several thousand nanometers. Well, we didn't see any, like, anything like that, fortunately, at this site. We saw some low resistivity anomalies that could be water-filled caves, but not quite as much of a problem if the water is connected with the creek and it's already in the cave. But we use this uh, to recommend some test boring locations. Here's one particular boring, and uh, it was... It, coordinated quite well. The, the blue in the subsurface in this case was the soil, and we get down into the, a variable weathered limestone, which had some various uh, resistivities associated with it. We were also able to identify fractures and uh, various layers uh, within, this, um, within this area. But the important thing, no, no large field caves identify, which reduced the, which helped everyone get a better comfort level if we reduced the risk of drilling in this area. So, summarize here in a couple slides. Know your target. What are the lithologic units? Uh, how deep are they? How thick are they? What are we looking for? This helps us design 
These are things we need to know to help us design an appropriate survey. The conditions of the rock, is it porous, is it fractured? Um, what's the water quality? How's that gonna affect our signals? Um, and then are there potential verticals or structural features that we wanna look for or need to identify? So sometimes we'll take a model, computer models will we'll pre-survey model what these signatures might be, depending on the method we're using, so we have a better idea and better understanding of what we're looking for. And then lastly, what are the study area conditions like? Um, is it, can I, get, can I get access to it? Uh, um, is it full of junk? Is it full of trash? Is it full of trees and, and vegetation? Are there fences everywhere? These are things we need to know ahead of time for planning and being, having a successful survey. So, Keys to success, communicate these expectations, uh, have experience in what you're doing, knowing, knowing how to apply these methodologies. Um, we wanna make sure we use the right tool for the right application. And then again, understand the target and the site characterizations. These are important as well to success. And then once we collect the data, we wanna make sure we take that data and we integrate it into the project. We just don't wanna collect it and set it on the shelf, put it in the back of the report. It, there's important information in these surveys and it needs to be integrated in with the engineers and the, and the hydrogeologists so that the full picture and the full understanding is understood. This is an important component to uh, any, any geophysical survey. So things to pick up. Geophysics can provide a more complete sampling density, and this helps us decrease the uncertainty in making decisions on, it, on a site. It provides data not attainable through drilling alone. Again, it complements drilling, but we get a much better picture of the subsurface, so we have a much better understanding, we can make much better uh, decisions. And it can help site these smaller drilling locations. It's also cost effective for the amount of data that is collected. I mean, we get a lot of data points uh, across aerially and at depth, and so it's a lot of information. And overall, this will increase your odds for success on any project where you're trying to cite a well or trying to have a better understanding of hydrogeology and the subsurface in order to make a decision going forward with whatever your project might be that's related to this. With that, I thank you. I've got time for questions. I think I just finished in time, yeah. Yes, sir. How, how deep is it in that area? Yeah, you'd, you'd want to use a seismic reflection. Would be the best way to do it. Yeah. Possibly a deep resistivity, but the reflection is going to give give a better approach. All right, we'll be around for a while. I'm going to yeah. ask you some additional questions. Thank you very much, Doug. I appreciate it. Thank you, Steve.